Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Libraries program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I shall be the reader today. As I uh, sat in Harbor Park yesterday in a contemplative moment overlooking the vast array of boats, big and small, weathered and new, white and blue and red and brown and blue and blue and blue, lots of blue, uh, and some many times painted over, I suddenly was lost in the summer of 1968. No, that's not a film. That was actually my life. <laughs> the adventure, the adventure, the stately presence in the harbor of the Grand Dame of the Windjammer fleet in those days. And me as a young college student in awe, in awe of the strength and the power and just the tales to be told if only the mass could talk. I worked on the adventure that summer below deck during the days of peeling potatoes. I was very good. Uh, cleaning corn, uh, washing blueberries, uh, cutting carrots. Uh, grew to be very terrific, um, but it was the late evenings after dinner was done and dusted and the galley was spotless that what remained solidly and colorfully in my mind for the past 54 years. And what was that? The stars, <laughs> the moonlight, the storytelling, and the entertainment, mostly by members of the crew, but the occasional guest trying desperately to remember the old sea chanty he once learned in grade school and thought that a couple of gin and tonics might help. <laughs> oh, unsurprisingly, perhaps, my contribution to the festivities was storytelling. And Edgar Allan Poe was my go-to man. Stories told in a very low-pitched voice with only a flashlight on my frightening eyes. Well, I was also a bit of a ham and a wannabe actor. The adventure. The ho, oh, what an adventure. Windjammers. Iconic Maine. Iconic Northeast Atlantic. But wait a minute. Only the Northeast Atlantic? The country was growing in such leaps and bounds in the early 19th century and up through the mid 1800s before the steamship changed the world forever. There must have been wind jammers and other sailing vessels on the other side of the country? Well, of course. And today's featured book tells that story. As a salute to Camden Windjammer Days this weekend of September 2 and 3, I thought it wise to see what the Northwest learned from the Northeast. We were here before they were. In the movement of people and cargo on the high seas from north to south and back again and well beyond. Wind Jammers of the Pacific Rim is the title of today's featured book. And it has been brilliantly compiled and commented on by the great salty dog of a storyteller from the Pacific Northwest, Jim Gibbs. But before exploring the story told, let's consider a few facts about the author. James A. Jim Gibbs, <laughs> born in 1922, was a forever proud son of Seattle, Washington. 
during his 88 years in that state and its neighbor, Oregon, Jim Never James was an author, a lighthouse keeper, and a maritime historian. He was one of the lighthouse keepers at Tillamook Rock Light for a year, beginning in 1945. Tillamook, hadn't heard that before, had to look it up. Tillamook Rock Light was officially lit on January 21, 1881. Located off the Northern Oregon coast, it was constructed approximately 1.2 miles offshore from Telemook Head and 20 miles south of the mouth of the Columbia River near Astoria. Now at the time, it was the single most expensive lighthouse to be built on the west coast of America. Due to the local erratic weather conditions and the dangerous commute for both keepers and suppliers, the lighthouse earned the nickname Terrible Tilly for Tillamook. Over the years, storms and the sea damaged the structure, shattered the lens and eroded the rock. The light was decommissioned in 1957 and was and has been sold several times to private owners. Hmm. In 1948, Gibbs was one of the five founders of the Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society based in Seattle. Always a sharp observer of the Northwest coastline, Jim finally chose to put as many jots, as he called them, to use as the editor of the Marine Digest magazine for 20 years, from 1952 to 1972. Jim, not Jimmy, built and lived in Cliff cleft, C-L-E-F-T, cleft of the rock light near Yachats, Oregon. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that to the people there in Oregon. The first privately owned working lighthouse in Oregon where he lived in his later years. In addition to today's featured book, Gibbs wrote and published 12 other books between 1953 and 1993 on lighthouses, ships, disasters, memories, and especially the Pacific wind ships of yesteryear. Additionally, Gibbs was a collector and contributor of nautical items to six maritime museums in Washington, Oregon, and in California. The great storyteller, Jim Gibbs, passed away on April 30th, 2010, leaving to posterity a wealth of seafaring information. Windjammers of the Pacific Rim. I'll quote here from the book, which I thought to be a very concise collection of words. As early settlers in California, Oregon, and Washington came around the Horn and sailed north from San Francisco, lumber for homes and industry went south by sea from the Northwest. Somewhat similar to our story. With nothing to guide them but the wind, compass, sextant, stars, and a sixth sense, the sturdy little ship struggled through fog and gales, more than half of them floundering. This is the story of those ships and of the intrepid pioneers who built them. Through 231 pages and 340 photographs, stirring tales are told and the story of windjammers, schooners, Bakentines, and other wind vessels and their crews 
is constructed to bring this golden age of wind ships to life. Wind Jammers of the Pacific Rim was published in 1987. Number eight in his pantheon of 13 books total. And a personal note, I'll quote this from the cover page, which I could not have written better myself. As the message on the inside front cover claims, Windjammers of the Pacific Rim is a story told by a man who understands the epic stature of Windjammers and can write with a feeling of a stalwart skipper, mate, and seaman of musty falsicles, of the crack and groan of blocks, wind in the ringing, and shanties sung about the capstan. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. Forgive me to my sailor friends. I'm not sure about foxicles. I think it's forecastles that has been shortened. So let us tell that tale of what was going on on the other side of the country while our great wind jammers were doing their thing on this side of the US of A. I'm going to start logically with the introduction and then go on to the golden age of sail. The golden age of sail. 340 photographs are just amazing. How the man possibly collected them, I will never know. So it begins like this. It was another era, another season <clears throat> in the passing parade of time. Ubiquitous was the West Coast commercial sailing schooner of yesteryear. Even as the sole label canvas covered prairie schooner, drawn by horse or ox team, made its way across the vast interior of the United States. So was the sailing schooner, pioneering Pacific coastal waters, carrying supplies for new settlements and hauling back urgently needed lumber for the growing established centers. The turbulent seas between destinations often tested ships and seafarers to the utmost. See how she schoons, excitedly exclaimed a bystander as a Gloucester sailing vessel slid into the bay in 1713. A schooner let her be, retorted Captain Andrew Robinson, and so it was. That standing yarn, whether it be true or false, was not, however, the birth of the schooner, nor was it a Yankee invention. According to the eminent Captain Alan Villiers, fore and afters plied the North Sea in the 1600s, skimming over shoals with leeboards raised. Yankee know-how is nevertheless credited with several innovations perfecting such vessels for the coastal trades. Sails abaft and masts allowed the schooner to lie close on to the wind and tack with relative ease in narrow waters. Some had centerboards allowing them to sail up rivers and into shallower portals. The initial schooner built on the west coast of North America was the little 40-ton Northwest America, rightly named. Under the direction of Captain John Mears, the vessel was constructed of native woods at Nootka Sound on Vancouver Island, some of the laborers being Chinese. Completed in the early fall of 1788, the vessel was later seized by the Spaniards and renamed Gertrudis. Following a treaty between Great Britain and Spain, the vessel, along with others, were returned to the British. The first Yankee schooner, built on the Pacific coast, was the effort of several pioneer Oregon farmers. She was the 53-ton Star of Oregon, built on the Willamette River in 1841. The winged clipper ship native to the East Coast 
brought throngs of prospectors to the specific to the Pacific slopes to search for gold in the wake of the big strike in 1848 near Sutter's Sawmill in California. Few treasure seekers found mineral fortunes, but many settled in the area. Homesteading farms and getting the wheels rolling on new industry, all of which was solely dependent on supply by water transport. A distinctive type of sailing schooner was developed, mostly by skilled artisans whose roots were on the New England coast. Yay. <laughs> Men who learned great wooden shipbuilding skills from crafty forebears and added their own know-how to create a schooner with a West Coast hallmark one that would become the lifeline for coastal pioneers. Not only was it a distinctive vessel, but one that demanded rugged, fearless hands before the mast and a steady hand at the helm. A glorious yet tragic record was accomplished, one ideally suited to the trade and geographic requirements of the Western coastal waters. Numerous sailing vessels were constructed on the Pacific coast after the 1840s, mostly to bring lumber to San Francisco from the Mendocino and Sonoma regions of Northern California and from the forested hills of the Pacific Northwest. Others brought coal ports from ports in British Columbia and Puget Sound. Northbound, the coasters carried general cargo and supplies of all descriptions to new logging camps and settlements. Offshore voyages turned the compass westward to the Sandwich, Hawaiian Islands, for sugar, northward to Alaska for pelts and fish, or on long hauls to timber-starved Australia. Long distance, that one. Lumbermen using beasts of burden hauled their products to the shoreside, utilizing the most direct route that was feasible. Logs either came overland or floated down water-filled chutes for several miles. High wharfs on trestles were built out across craggy promontories and rocky outcrops. From the bitter end of the wharfs, inclined wooden chutes were slung, down which a torrent of lumber cascaded to the decks of the schooners moored precariously with large anchors forward and aft, and sometimes to port and starboard, open as they were to the full fury of the sea. By the 1870s, high strength wire cable became available, which permitted more flexible and innovative loading, giving rise to the oft repeated phrase, coming in under the wire. This often dangerous method frequently left defenseless vessels at the mercy of coastless coastal obstructions, when irascible seas rose with sudden momentum, whipped by squalls or gales, sometimes scattering helpless seamen and their ships upon hostile tentacles. When more conventional modes of stevedoring were developed and harbor facilities were erected at the mouths of rivers or inside safe portals, lumber schooners were often moored stern first, into piers, and loaded from lengthy ramps over the poop or through special loading ports located near the transcom. Prevailing westerly winds blowing directly onshore demanded a capability of the windjammer to beat to windward, and the requirements of specific trades resulted in features and features foreign to the East Coast sailors. There were few with centerboards, most being keel vessels. Yet it was remarkable where the keel vessels were able to go, such as the schooners that hauled tan bark, slithering into places like Frankport on the southern Oregon coast, north of Gold Beach, anchoring among tall, ominous sea stacks. Through the versatility of the schooner received wide recognition in nautical circles, they also had their setbacks, for no matter how ingenious the rig, every vessel of sail was entirely dependent on wind. 
when becalmed or clawing up the coast against adverse winds and contrary seas, it was difficult with a capital D. All good things must come to an end. The tradition uh, the basic stumbling block being the birth of the steam schooner, which would eventually push the traditional sailing schooner into near oblivion on the coastal routes. The economic factors of sail versus steam allowed them to hang on tenaciously for a few more decades, most going into various alternate trades. They became South Sea Island traders, sealers, cod fishers, etc., all of which brought about new combination of sail best suited to the individual trades. For instance, the Alaska schooners were among the first to adopt the Pacific Coast leg of mutton rig, featuring a triangle sail set on the top mast and sheeted to the boom end, a combination of topsail and ringsail, according to Howard Chappelle in his History of American Sailing Ships. Similar to Essex, Massachusetts built fishing schooners of the 1870s, though fuller ended, the Pacific fishing schooners were somewhat unique, as were the South Pacific trading schooners, which bore some of the features of the Grand Banks Gloucester codfish schooners, plus some of the swiftness of the Baltimore clippers, though marked by high quarter decks or large houses aft. The sugar packets, probably the fastest commercial sailing vessels in the Pacific in the bygones, featured all the best sailing qualities of the above mentioned vessels, setting highly enviable records between the West Coast and the Hawaiian Islands. Then there was the San Francisco Bay exclusive, the clumsy yet economical scow schooner flat-bottomed and square-ended, fitted with two fore and aft rigged masts. Mostly they worked the waters of the Bay Area and environs, but some inadvisedly served as coasters. They were by no means an open sea craft, but were very handy at carrying a wide variety of cargo on the Bay. According to Chappelle, quote, the rig of many Pacific Coast constructed schooners featured many details not seen elsewhere. The square course, when not set on schooners, was furled up and down the mast rather than on the yard, the sails being on rings. When sail was to be set, it was hauled out along the yards by out hands, by out hauls to the yard arms. There were many variations of this rig, but all on the same principle. Though this method of setting a square sail was used abroad, it was not seen in the United States except on the Pacific coast. Schooner skippers took great pride in their commands and enjoyed fast passages, boasting loudly of record voyages, and certainly some remarkable voyages were recorded. For instance, the schooner Sadie, around the turn of the century, sailed 940 miles from San Pedro, California to Oregon's Umpqua River, port of Gardner. Took on a full load of lumber and returned to San Pedro in just under 17 days. Not totally content to rest on those laurels, the skipper took his 311 ton, three-masted sati on a voyage laden with 400,000 board feet of lumber. Umpqua River to San Pedro in just three days, 14 hours. What a show off. <laughs> Such passages coastwise were the exception, however, for often contrary winds and cantankerous seas cause serious delays, such as the shorter distance route of the schooner Wing and Wing, which in 1883 required 40 days to sail from Santa Cruz, California to Coos Bay, Oregon. Expert seamanship was required to take schooners across a bar entrance for swells, currents and wind. All had to be carefully calculated. 
Though tugs were of great assistance, many tough ship masses made hundreds of cro crossings completely on their own. Wrecks and strandings were numerous. Wind is a fickle commodity. Captain Oliver Peterson, master of the Lucy, a seasoned salt, tried for four weeks in 1907 to get across the Umqua Bar. Time after time, he had to come up about when adverse weather, high seas, and contrary currents and bar swells prevented transit over the bar. Finally, in desperation, with a crew facing near starvation, Captain Peterson took his vessel up the coast, entered the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the protection of Puget Sound. A considerable evolution in sailing vessels took place in America through the age of sail. Though several full rigged ships, barks, barkentines, brigs, and brigantines, were turned out on the coasts of America, the schooner, due to its more simple rig, economic factors, and smaller crews, made it the sweetheart of the domestic trades and to some extent to offshore routes as well. Though most of the early schooners on the West Coast were two masters, evolution moved swiftly to three, four, and five masters. Then came the ultimate during the World War I period when the Cruise and Banks Shipbuilding Company in North Bend, Oregon, turned out the six-masted schooner Fort Laramie. 2,240 tons, the first of three six masters built on the Pacific coast. I guess we could assume the other three were built on the Atlantic coast. The photographs are amazing, really. <laughs> she was one step up from the many five-masted schooners and barkentines, turned out in the same time frame. The massive wooden vessel found only limited usage following the war and was finally burned for scrap on Puget Sound in 1935. The other two six masters built were the sister ships, Oregon Pine and Oregon Fir by the Peninsula Shipbuilding Company in Portland. They went down the ways in 12, 1920 and were slightly greater in tonnage from the Fort Laramie. Later renamed Dorothy H. Sterling and Helen B. Sterling, respectively, both ended their days under the Breaker's Hammer in Australia in the early 1930s. It was basically the end of an era. The past is often pictured through a romantic haze, compounded of selective contemporary discontent and forgetfulness. Gazing at a cloud of canvas gliding gracefully along the horizon brings longings for days that will never again return. There comes a yearning for the days of wooden ships and iron men and of gnarled old salts telling their yarns and adventures along a rugged and demanding coastline and in offshore ports of intrigue. Actually, economic realities were the same then as they are today, and a ship was a means for satisfying commercial desires. Its form and composition changed in conformity with those desires and with advances in technology. In all of America, there were only 10 six-masted sailing vessels constructed, three of which were on the West Coast. I guess I got that wrong earlier. That means seven were ours. A few others were converted from five masters. The first six master was the George W. Wells, built in, drumroll, Camden, Maine. Let me repeat that sentence. The first six master on the East Coast was the George W. Wells, built in Camden, Maine at the turn of the century, of nearly 3,000 tons with a length of 342 feet. Amazing. The greatest schooner ever built in America, or for the matter, the world, 
was the only seven masted vessel of that rig, the Thomas W. Lawson. She, however, had a steel hull. Built in 1902 at Quincy, Massachusetts, she carried a 16-man crew aided by steam machinery to handle the sails. She capsized in an Atlantic gale of 1907. Only five years old was she, carrying all but two of her crew to a watery grave. The mammoth fore and after measured more than 375 feet between perpendiculars and had a tonnage exceeding 5,000. Enormous. In our present day maritime world of super ships, one can hardly realize that for nearly seven decades, the basic commerce on the West Coast was carried on to a great degree by sailing vessels. Most were created by master craftsmen without the aid of blueprint or power tools. Manned by daring and rugged men of the sea and owned by empire builders, great and small. Upon such ships of sail was the West Coast of the United States largely developed. In their time, some 60% of the coastal schooners stranded were in collision, foundered, or burned, and many lives were lost. Shipyards from Northern California to British Columbia fashioned the ultimate in wind jammers to carry on the trade of the Pacific, and a golden era it was. Today, only reflections and memory remain, and indeed, these are perishable and intangible items. As a youth, the writer spent much of his time exploring the rows of idle sailing vessels moored in Seattle's Lake Union. It was great adventure to roam the deserted decks of the tall square riggers, riding in, at anchor at historic Eagle Harbor on Bainbridge Island to size up the wind jammers crowded into Astoria's Young's Bay and to vagabond among the derelicts in Rotten Row on San Francisco Bay. The writer was present as they touched the torch to numerous old sailing vessels on the shores of Puget Sound at Richmond Beach and Picnic Point. It was indeed a fascinating segment of one's life to be a witness to the last chapter of the Windjammer, the closing of a glorious era which children of the space age will never be privileged to enjoy. From early Bible times, sail had reigned until the 20th century. As one watched the great pillars of orange flame and curling smoke spiraling skyward from oak soaking, soaked sailing ship hulls in the 1930s, it was like watching thousands of years of history brought to a sudden jarring halt. The sweat and toil that had gone into such wooden sailing craft was snuffed out in minutes as massive infernos left beaches littered with twisted bits of metal fittings. Sometimes through the flames, one could imagine the glorious years when the sailing ships reigned supreme in the world of marine transportation. The rough, tough men who sailed before the mast, the strident commands of skipper and bucko mate, the yawn spun and the damp, musty forcicles, the creaking and groaning of block and tackle, the overpowering sou'westers and the bitter nor'easters, the pulsating gray seas, the chanty sung around the capstan, the romance of foreign ports with exotic sights, of palm fringed South Sea islands with their chocolate colored maidens, of booming little lumber ports, the winding Columbia River and the harbor lights of San Francisco. One could ramble on and on through memory. This book is an effort to bring back some of the salty air of the day of sail, of wooden ships and iron men. As the pen of John Macefield has so aptly scrolled, quote, I must go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea and the sky 
and all I ask is a tall, tall ship and a star to steer her by. The photos used in Windjammers of the Pacific Horn a Rim came from many sources. Some were taken by professional photographers of yesteryear, some by old salts who sailed before the mast. Others were found in old steamer trunks and sea chest. In some instances, they were reproduced from faded, torn photos, lacking clarity and complete detail. For historical purposes, they have been used to afford more complete picture coverage of this virtually forgotten fleet of windjammers. So romantic as his writing makes you see it all, doesn't it? I wonder if there are still wind jams on the West Coast as we have here now. Maybe we shouldn't tell them. The Golden Age of Sail is a, a shorter chapter, so we'll finish with it. The Age of Sail on the Pacific Coast was an era of pioneering. <laughs> it was a time when men went down to the sea in ships because the sea lanes were the only lifeline for the mushrooming settlements along the coast. Except for the wooden ships and iron men who braved the dog holes the, and treacherous bar entrances, the history of the West Coast would never have been written. With not to guide them, but the wind, a simple compass, a sextant, the stars, and a sixth sense, these hardy mariners suffered a heavy toll in lives and property. Only when the steam-powered ship came into the limelight did it begin to crowd the wind ship off the coastal seas and offshore runs. To fight progress was a losing battle, and though nothing had the glamour of the windjammer, even the most zealous of these before the mass had to admit that the extra thrust of an engine was inestimable value when the wind died while crossing the sandbar, or when the set of the wind and the current carried a vessel even closer to destruction. Though steam gradually put these winged beauties of yesteryear on the decline, None will forget the doughty men before the masts who depended only on off-patched canvas to get them from one port to another. The windjammers built on the Pacific coast from the mid-19th century were created for the most part to bring lumber to San Francisco from Northern California ports and the Pacific Northwest. They usually returned with general cargo and supplies for the little settlements from whence the lumber originated. Some of these wind ships carried lumber to the Antipodes or went to the South Sea Islands for cargoes of copra. Numerous others scudded to the Sandwich Islands, now called the Hawaiian Islands, for sugar. Some loaded salmon or cod in Alaska. And then when there was no fish, sometimes came home to California with a load of ice. There was also a well-worn trade lane from British Columbia and Puget Sound to San Francisco, whereby overloaded windjammers arrived with holds overflowing with coal. The need for Pacific Coast built sailing vessels came to the wake of the discovery of gold in California in 1849. Tall, swift clipper ships and paddle wheel steamers were coming around from the East Coast, bringing thousands of gold hungry folk to the Great West. Other pioneers took the land route, braved the rigors of mountain passes, unfriendly natives, and adverse weather via covered wagon. To keep up with those who came by sea, their conveyances were affectionately named prairie schooners. Precious little has been told of the Pacific Coast sailing vessels that played such a dominant role in the making of the West. As the tall timbered shores of the Pacific Northwest beckoned, little mills popped up in hidden bays and coves on Puget Sound along the winding Columbia River and in small bays and river entrances along the remote shores of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Small shipyards were primitively established alongside the mills where master shipbuilders who had migrated from the New England states mm -hmm, put their cunning and skill to work. With the barest of essentials, they built some of the finest coastal and offshore windjammers the world has ever known. 
The timbers for the stout hulls were shaped right on the sea. Predominant was the schooner, sprightly, fast, and commodious. Two-masted, three-masted, four-masted, and five-masted. There was also a sprinkling of barks, barkentines, sprigs, brigantines, and full-rigged ships. The perfection of the schooner, however, which could take full advantage of the prevalent inshore and offshore winds, which could maneuver in tight spots or in devilish weather, uh, the steam steamers took over. Some resigned themselves to progress and learned new ways. For others, they would rather have died with their ships than to make the switch. H. E. Jameson, a former waterfront correspondent, frequently told the story of one of these typical holdouts in the latter day of sail, when the last of the sailing ships were lined up in backwater moorages, tied up in groups like aged ladies with their knitting, sitting on the porch of an old folks home. This old skipper dreamed of the days when his ship rushed through blue waters at steamer speed under clouds of billowy canvas, the creamy bow wash gurgling a symphony of speed and grace, music to his troubled mind. One day, the old shell back was found dead on the deck of his four-masted schooner. Both he and his beloved vessel had outlived their usefulness. Like him, the neglected windjammer had bowed her head in shame while scaly tramps crowded her off the seas. True, many captains and ships have ended their lives together, but that usually has been at sea after an unsuccessful combat with the elements. Ships, as a rule, are company owned. And then where they are no longer profitable, they are relegated to the ship breakers, the shallow backwaters or the torch. It is rare indeed that both ship and captain find a snug harbor, drop in anchor to windward and wait to be cleared by the master mariner. However, this old shipper chose to ignore the march of progress Neither he nor his ship were through. He kept trying to convince himself. Day after day, he made the rounds of the shipping offices, chartering houses, and brokers. He went from office to office seeking any kind of a cargo. Even garbage would have sufficed. Ain't there any lumber moving to South Africa? He would ask. We could beat them steam rates a heap. Always the answer would be a sharp no. Wearily, he would row back to his ship by nightfall, drag himself up the Jacob's Ladder, trying hard not to notice the opening seams in the vessel's sides. He talked to his ship as though it were a live thing. Now, don't you worry, he'd say. We'll get something yet. There came the inevitable day when he had to admit defeat. He was no longer up to the tremendous effort of rowing to shore and making his rounds. On cold and rainy days, he huddled close to the galley stove to warm his thinning blood. The occasional bright day brought him up on deck for long hours of pacing on the poop, a tattered old sea jacket bundled about him. He would frequently tilt his head aloft and look at the tattered and neglected rigging. His failing eyes, however, didn't see the rot, but only visions of billowing sail bellied to the wind, the creaking and groaning of the main brace and the limber seamen going aloft. One bitter evening, the chill of the wind chipping, whipping the water drove him into his cabin. He was cold and there was no fuel. The watchman on a neighboring vessel saw him climb shakily up the shrouds of the mizzen mast to the cross trees, laboriously unship the topmast and then lower it by block and 
tackle to the deck. The meditations of his heart were obvious only to him. He was telling his ship that this was the Puget Sound country from whence came the finest spas in the world. In need of more fuel, the next day he repeated the same operation on another mast. It was too much for him. It was like feeding off the carcass of his best friend. He stumbled into his cabin and died. In days of yore, the difficult crossings of the coastal bars were frequently beset by endless delay and often tragedy. Numerous wind jammers left their bones to whiten on the sandbars and were snagged by the sharp teeth of hostile, rock-bound coasts. Echoing the rock-bound coast of Maine as well. Well, I wish I could show you 340 photographs, but I doubt we have time. <laughs> but the book is, is a wonderful journey uh, for so many people in the area who know so much about the history of shipbuilding and sailing from along Midcoast Maine. It's a rich, rich history. And before, of course, the Pacific Rim. At least he mentioned us a couple of times. <laughs> including the Sixth Master, which was terrific to see Camden, Maine, in a book on the Pacific Rim. I enjoyed it a lot. I hope you will look it up. It's actually not in Minerva within the library system. So I am going to deliver this book to the library as a gift since it's new and fresh. So we shall give it to them so that if you want to search for it, you can find it at the Camden Public Library or, of course, on Minerva. Let's talk a little bit about next week. Uh, we're going to sort of stay in the neighborhood in a way, talking about Camden, not about the Pacific Rim. We are going to go to a book that is proving to be the hot topic of the day. When I selected the book, I thought it sounded wonderful. Well, I'm still eighth in the queue with the library system of Maine to get my copy. <laughs> so I'm dashing down to uh, Sherman's today and they've got one copy left. They're saving it for me. So it seems as though we've got our finger on the pulse. Everyone seems to be reading this book. The name of our book next week is Fellowship Point, a novel written by Alice Elliott Dark. Fellowship Point is the masterful story of a lifelong friendship between two very different women with shared histories and buried secrets, tested in the twilight of their lives, set across the arc of the 20th century. I will read just one more paragraph here. I'll just read the first one. It's too many otherwise. Celebrated children's book author Agnes Lee, this is now from the book, is determined to secure her legacy, to complete what she knows will be the final volume of her pseudonymously written Franklin Square novels, and even more consuming to permanently protect the peninsula of majestic coast in Maine known as Fellowship Point. To no donate the land to a trust, Agnes must convince shareholders to dissolve a generation's old partnership. And one of those shareholders is her best friend, Polly. Fellowship Point reads like a classic 19th century novel. In its beautifully woven multi-layered narrative, but it is entirely contemporary in the themes it explores. A deep and emphatic interest in women's lives, the class differences that divided us, the struggle to protect the natural world, and above all, a reckoning with intimacy, history, and posterity. It is a masterwork from Alice Elliott Dark.
Well, if you're waiting in the queue for the book, just hold off. I'll read you part of it next week. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Pacific Rim to celebrate and salute Camden Windjammer Days this weekend. Such an exciting time, especially to be down in Rockland, out there in the sea at the Samoset to watch them parade by. I uh, am glad you joined me. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed today's program, uh, please do press the magic button, like it with the thumbs up. And consider sharing it with a friend, someone who you think might find it quite interesting what happened on the West Coast. Also, please feel free to leave a comment. And I also encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library's Programs YouTube channel to, see, to stay on top of all of the great content. Last week, I mentioned that we were four shy of being the number one library in the state of Maine with the number of subscribers to the program's website. So we made it to number one, hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> Thank you to those who subscribed. And as of today, as I sit here now, we are still number one. So keep your fingers crossed. We'd like to say number one, well, let's see, for the rest of the year, how's that? Thank you again. It's a pleasure reading this book today. I hope your week is a good one ahead. And above all, just, Pause and take care of yourself. Thank you. Goodbye.